morning, our saviors. It is nice to see you this morning on our second week of Advent, second Sunday in Advent. And we have all kinds of neat things happening today. Um, We'll have the choir singing. We'll have the praise band playing for the first time in who knows how long. Uh, That'll be nice. We'll also be lighting these Advent candles. So I'd like to invite the Koskalen family up, and you guys can assemble around that Advent wreath. And uh, we're excited to... uh, to uh, continue our practice of lighting a uh, candle for each Sunday that we are in Advent. So today we'll light two candles. And uh, I'll go ahead and let uh, Thomas do the next part. Let us pray. Blessed are you, God of hope, for you promised to bring forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, who will bring justice to the poor, who will deliver the needy and crush the oppressor, who will stand as a single of hope for all people. As we light these candles, turn our wills to bear the fruit of repentance, transform our hearts to live in justice and harmony with one another, and fix our eyes on the root of Jesse, Jesus Christ, the hope of all nations. now with the candles having been lit, I invite you to stand as we continue with confession and forgiveness. Blessed is the Holy Trinity, one God, who alone does wonders, who lifts up the lowly, and who fills the hungry with good things. Amen. Let us confess our sin, trusting in the tender mercy of our God. God, for whom we wait, in the presence of one another, we confess our sin before you. We fail in believing that your good news is for us. We falter in our call to tend your creation. We find our sense of self and material wealth. We fear those different from ourselves. We forget that we are your children and turn away from your love. Forgive us, blessed one and assure us again of your saving grace. Amen. God in Christ Jesus has looked with favor upon you. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, your sins are forgiven. You are children of the Most High, inheritors of the eternal promise, and recipients of divine mercy. God strengthens you anew to follow the way of peace. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Stir up our hearts, Lord God, to prepare the way of your only Son. By his coming, give to all the people of the world knowledge of your salvation. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Yes, it's 
reading from Malachi. <clears throat> See, I am sending my messenger to prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, indeed, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts, but who can endure the day of his coming, and who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire, and like fuller's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he will purify the descendants of Levi and refine them like gold and silver until they present offerings to the Lord in righteousness. Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to the Lord as in the days of old and as in former years. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. For our psalm this morning, um, you may recognize this tune. We're going to sort of sing and chant this together. The words are very similar to the psalm that came in our lectionary, and I thought, when we can sing the psalm, let's sing the psalm. Uh, so this is from Hold an Evening Prayer, and uh, I invite you to sing with me as John gives me the first note there. Mm. May God be with you all. Let us sing our thanks to God. Blessed are you, Creator of the universe. From old you have led your people by night and day. May the light of your Christ make our darkness bright. For your word and your presence are the light of our pathways. And you are the light and life of all creation. Amen. A reading from Philippians. I thank my God every time I remember you, constantly praying with joy in every one of my prayers for all of you, because of your sharing in the gospel from the first day until now. I am confident of this, that the one who began a good work among you will bring it to completion by the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to think this way about all of you, because you hold me in your heart, for all of you share in God's grace with me both in my imprisonment and in the de defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness, how I long for all of you with the compassion of Christ Jesus. And this is my prayer, 
that your love may overflow more and more with knowledge and full insight to help you to determine what is best, so that in the day of Christ you may be pure and blameless, having produced the harvest of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ for the glory and praise of God. The word of the Lord. according to Luke, the third chapter. In the fifteenth year of the reign of Emperor Tiberius, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, and Herod was ruler of Galilee, and his brother Philip, ruler of the region of Eritrea and Trachonitis, and Lysanias, ruler of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. He went into all the region around the Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of the prophet Isaiah, the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled and every mountain and hill shall be brought low and the crooked shall be made straight and the rough ways made smooth and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. The Gospel of our Lord. You may be seated. I'd like to invite the children up for the children's sermon. So kids of any age, if you you consider yourself a children, you can come on up. So I have something to show you guys today. You guys ever seen one of these guys? Yeah, do you guys have one? There you go. Okay, good, good, good. Okay, so you guys have seen this. Have you looked at today's yet? So what I have is uh, a deck of cards that um, we had gotten for a lot of the young families here at church. And um, they're like playing cards, but instead of playing cards, they are a card with each day of Advent through here. So they started for this year on November 28th, and each card has... They got a little, like, a cool little picture on the back, and it's a different one on each one. And then on the front, they have the date and, like, a little um, discussion starter or activity to do together or prayer. So let's look at what we have. What's today's date? Do you guys remember? The 5th. You're right. January 5th, indeed. December 5th. We're not to January yet, are we? Still 2021. Okay. Good catch. So December, oh, there's two in here, December 5th. Oh, Jesus had many family members whose stories are in the Bible. This week's gospel story is about Jesus' cousin. Oh, I just read about him. Do you guys remember what his name is? It's John. You guys know anyone named John? Probably a few guys, right? John the Baptist. You guys know anyone named John the Baptist? Yeah, there's a guy in the Bible, but you probably don't know anyone in your personal life named John the Baptist, but it would be cool if you did. During Advent, we also hear the stories of Jesus' mother, Mary, Jesus' father, Joseph, very good, and relatives Elizabeth and Zechariah. Draw your family tree, however you define family, and write down your favorite thing about each person you know on your family tree and then share it with them. You guys know what a family tree is? Yeah, you've ever drawn one before or seen one? So let's see. Uh, think about who you might have known or who might have really helped you uh, grow up. You guys might think of parents would be on your family tree. Who else would be on your family tree? 
Brothers, yeah. You guys both have a lot of brothers, huh? Between you guys, there's like five brothers of you guys. Okay. Who else than brothers? Grandparents. Grandparents would be on there. That's good. Parents, grandparents, brothers, all those people that you're related to. Um, that's pretty cool. That's a pretty cool thing to remember, all those people that made it possible for you to be here, right? And you might also ask, what was Jesus' family tree? You guys said his mom's name was Mary and his dad's name was Joseph, right? But he, now we just heard about his cousin, John. You guys probably have cousins too, don't you? Yeah? So think about all those people that are in your life that make you have a place to belong, a family to be part of. That's kind of nice, right? Yeah. So we'll give thanks for family today, and when you're home, you can think about all your different family members and the things that you like about them or that you're thankful for, okay? Does that sound good? All right, thank you guys for coming up. You guys can head back to your seat. Old John the Baptist, cousin of Jesus. This morning he comes to us, and he says some things. He delivers a message, and part of that message comes from the prophet Isaiah. Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill shall be made low. Now, some of you more faithful earth stewardship folks might hear those words in horror. You might think, why should we blow up a mountain and smooth it down? Why should we dump soil into the valley and cover up all the life and habitat there? Well, we're not talking about physical valleys. And this message isn't calling for bulldozers to pull the mountains of dirt down and make the land smooth. No, God's message is speaking about some other mountains and valleys. The mountains of wealth that the powerful have amassed and the valleys of debt put upon the lowly. It reminds me of Jesus' mother that we just talked about there a second ago, Mary and her beautiful Magnificat from that Holden evening service that we sang the psalm from earlier. You may remember, You have cast the mighty down from their thrones and uplifted the humble of heart. You have filled the hungry with wondrous things and left the wealthy no part. That's the word of the Lord. That word comes to us this morning in a powerful way. The powerful word of the Lord comes to a specific place, in a specific time, to proclaim a specific message. The Gospel of Luke roots this story in very specific terms, using names of all those leaders I read there at the beginning of our Gospel reading. Those are leaders in the political world of the Mediterranean, that whole Roman Empire that was in power, as well as the political leaders of first century Palestine, the local area, as well as the religious leaders of the Jewish people. And this account, I think, is helpful for us because Luke's gospel uses broad, universal language that's meant for everyone. He names not just the local religious leaders, but like I said, uh, empire leaders. Um, He also will use different language throughout that none of the other gospel writers use. So if you read in Matthew or Mark or John, you'll see them refer to that body of water as the Sea of Galilee. Luke refers refers to it as the Sea of Tiberias. Now Tiberias is mentioned in our reading, and it was called Tiberias (laughs) after Tiberius Caesar, son of Augustus Caesar, and he is a really interesting guy. Uh, Tiberius was never trained to be emperor. His dad thought he was so divine that he would never die. And shock of all shocks, he died. So his son, who was not trained at all and is not prepared to be emperor of this vast Roman Empire, now is thrust into the role. And not only is he unprepared, Tiberius doesn't even want to be emperor. So he doesn't like his arranged marriage to this woman for political power. So he goes off and has an affair with this woman he does like. And he's always escaping secretly out into the countryside. And the Senate has to send the Roman army to find him and haul him back to Rome to sit as emperor. 
Can you imagine being emperor and not wanting it? You know, you're given the most powerful position on earth, and you say, nah, I'll pass. That was Tiberius. So the Sea of Galilee, uh, the rest of the world knew it as the Sea of Tiberius after this emperor. And the word of the Lord should have come to Tiberius. The word of the Lord should have come to Pontius Pilate. The word of God could have come to Herod or his brother Philip or any other regional ruler like Lysanias that I read at the beginning of the gospel reading. It ought to have come, especially ought to have been heard by Annas and Caiaphas, the high priests. But it did not. It was not heard by any of those people. Luke lists all these names, all these offices, and all these high-ranking people so that we know all the people whom the word of the Lord was not received by. They did not have ears to hear. So the word of the Lord bypasses them and comes to someone who does have ears to hear. The word of the Lord comes to this crazy, bo- crazy guy with a beard named John. No, not our crazy guy with a beard named John. Uh, it's a different John. As I mentioned earlier, the cousin of Jesus is John the Baptist. And these various figures, who did not receive the word of the Lord, get bypassed so that a far-out guy from the wilderness has to deliver it. A guy none of us will be clamoring to sit next to in church right now. A guy many of us might call the cops on, or suggest that he should be admitted to the insane asylum. A guy wearing camel skins and eating what he forages in the wilderness. Mainly locusts, because that's what's there. Good old John the Baptist. The baptizer acts as a hinge between the Old Testament and the New Testament. He's this Old Testament kind of prophet. Think Elijah and Samuel and those guys. Who He comes as that kind of prophet, but he proclaims the coming of of the man whom the New Testament is based on, Jesus. So he's the last of the Jewish prophets, and he acts as a hinge between the old and the new. In short, the Word of God comes to someone who enters our lives shockingly from outside our norms. This is not a polished televangelist. This is not a model with a nice new Eddie Bauer sweater or Patagonia jacket. He doesn't have a nice haircut. He doesn't have a fashionable trim to his beard. Can we hear a word from such a man? Do we have ears to hear it? Do we find within ourselves the capacity to open our ears to the message that such a person might bring us? And what is this message that John the Baptist brings us? Well, he paves the way. He sets the table. He tells us to prepare for the arrival of the Messiah. So he instructs us to make ready, prepare the way of the Lord, as we heard the choir sing a minute ago. John teaches us how to prepare after instructing us to prepare. He tells us to ready ourselves, and he shows us how to anticipate. So how do we prepare for Christ's arrival? Well, there's a whole lot of ways. We're walking through those ways during the season of Advent. But John says one of the things we do to prepare for the arrival of Christ is to repent. So we might ask ourselves, well, what is repentance? This is not a word we use at work a whole lot or in the common culture. That word repentance in Greek is the word metanoia. You might have heard it before because Pastor Tim likes to speak about it sometimes. Metanoia. And one way to understand metanoia is as a turnaround, a 180 degree turn from where you were going before. And boy, do we humans need to turn around sometimes. We need to have a change of heart, a change of mind. And we need it, I think, almost daily. Part of that is because of all sorts of reasons, but I think a primary reason is that we've all inherited stuff that we need to turn around from. Our brains have been honed through the years for survival, for instance. And that's a good thing in the past. It kept people alive. It allowed humans to keep existing. But that's not helpful for happiness or for holiness. For instance, 
our brains develop to consume as many calories whenever we can, as much as we can, so that we can last as long as possible until the next opportunity presents itself to consume calories. And that's great for survival, but it's not so great for happiness. It's not so great for the disciplines of self-control or the fruits of the Spirit. It's not so great to uh, imagine yourself that you let yourself go unchecked in this regard. And so that you eat as much as you can, always, as often as you can, and you very likely will find yourself in a place where you're not very happy at the end of all that. So if we think about repentance as turning around 180 degrees, that might include recognizing and acknowledging once again that our natural predisposition towards consuming can be turned around and then put in check so that we are oriented toward giving rather than toward consuming. So yes, John the baptizer gives us strong words, but they should be understood as a good thing, not a harsh thing. This call to repentance is more of an invitation than it is a command, an invitation to a deeper and fuller life than the one we live without examining ourselves. It's an opportunity for deep dwelling peace that can come to reside in us if we turn away from the unexamined life. And this invitation is precisely how that works. That's the order of events. God's love comes first. Unmerited, unearned, we know that. And that love then opens us up to repentance and change and all the benefits those bring. Not the other way around. Repentance is not a condition, but a result. It's not a condition for God's love. It is the result of God's love. So John tells us to repent as a principal part of our preparation for God's coming. But the repentance is not only a result of God's love, but it's one piece among many in our preparations during Advent. John tells us to make ready. In short, you could almost say John the Baptist tells us to designate the baby room, to put in the cradle, to decorate the walls, to assemble the crib, the baby's on its way. You might have noticed when you were coming in here an image of Mary, and it's this Eastern Orthodox image. of uh, It's an engraving of Mary, and you see the Christ child there in her stomach, and she is, uh, she is getting near delivery. And there's a quote that, um, that I like to refer to from Meister Eckhart, who is a medieval uh, philosopher, and... Uh, and a spiritualist, and he said, we are all needing to be, well, let's see, I better read it to you so I don't mess it up. We are all meant to be mothers of God, for God is always needing to be born. God is always needing to be born. It's not something that happened just a long time ago, and then we're done with it as an historical event, and we're able to move on to other things. God is always needing to be born, and we participate in that birthing process during Advent. We have been together preparing for a new world. We've been slowly, but surely, I think, taking little baby steps toward a new world. You may remember that nine, ten months ago, we were not worshiping in here. Then we started worshiping in here. Before that, even, we were only worshiping online, and then we started doing drive-in worship, something we had never considered before, but then started doing. And then once we started worshiping in here, we started to add singing. You guys may remember the very first Sundays we were in here, we didn't have any songs, but then we started adding singing. Recently, we started chanting the communion liturgy, which we'll do today, and we've been doing that for several weeks. We have started Bible studies and women's circles. We have kids' choirs that are meeting and not just singing, but playing instruments together and gifting us with music at various services. We have Sunday school that's started up. Um, We have started, for the first time ever, starting to partner with Bird Elementary. And you guys donate to that, and then once a month I pack that stuff into my trunk and take it up to families in need for food and essential things for living. We have a new choir director, and you guys heard the choir sing today. Wasn't that nice? Very nice. 
So we get to, we get to hear our adult choir sing uh, and, and worship sometimes. We have a new way of doing meals together, thanks to the council with their vision and leadership and work. Uh, we had a meal downstairs last Wednesday, and we'll do it again this Wednesday. And it was a nice time to eat and fellowship with each other. And then Little Cardinals Preschool, one of our ministries to the community, is meeting throughout the week on Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays. Together, we have been taking baby steps. And because they're baby steps and they don't happen all at the same time, sometimes you forget about them and you think, ah, everything's been the same for so long. But it hasn't at all. We keep inching forward. Just like in Advent, we're inching forward day by day to the arrival of Christ. Shane Claiborne is one of my favorite authors, and he describes Advent this way. Advent means the coming, and it's a time when we wait expectantly. Christians began to celebrate it as a season during the 4th and 5th centuries, that's over 1,500 years ago. Like Mary, we celebrate the coming of the Christ child, what God has already done, and we wait in expectation for the full coming of God's reign on earth and for the return of Christ, what God will yet do. But this waiting is not a passive waiting. It is an active waiting. As any expectant mother knows, this waiting also involves preparation, exercise, nutrition, care, prayer, work. And birth itself involves pain, blood, tears, joy, release, community. It's called labor for a reason. Likewise, we are in a world pregnant with hope, and we live in the expectation of the coming of God's kingdom on earth. As we wait, we also work, cry, pray, and ache. We are the midwives of another world. Sisters and brothers, you and I are midwives of another world. We are preparing together for the arrival, for the birth, for the new creation to present itself. And that new creation is Emmanuel, God with us. This is indeed good news for us. It is the gospel of our Lord. Amen. Oh, and I have to boogie over here. Uh, We're going to sing a song together, and I invite you to stand for the hymn of the day, and uh, you'll be able to follow up there. You guys should be familiar with uh, with this song. Go ahead, John. Shines in the darkness, and the light will light. 
You may be seated for the prayer. <clears throat> In this season of watching and waiting, let us pray for all the people and places that yearn for God's presence. You send messengers into the world to proclaim the day of your coming. Make our bishops, pastors, deacons, and lay preachers confident in their preaching that their words and our lives witness to your grace. Hear us, O oh God. Send your spirit to all living creatures that are endangered. Provide them with shelter and care and bring us into right relationships with the earth that you create and call good. Hear us, O oh God. Send leaders to our nations, cities, schools, and businesses to work on behalf of those who have lost parents, spouses, and loved ones, immigrants, the imprisoned, those living in poverty, and all who are oppressed. Make them bold in their commitments to justice and reconciliation. Hear us, O God. Send your servants to care for those who suffer. Use our ministry and our lives to reach out with compassion to those who are hungry, oppressed, lonely, or ill, especially John, Phyllis, Scott, Dale, Chris, Warren, and Jerry. Grant them healing and wholeness. Heal us, O oh God. Send prophets to speak difficult truths, even when they are poorly received. Embolden those who ask hard questions and challenge accepted ways. Instill in youth and elders alike a passion for pointing to Jesus in all things. Hear us, O oh God. We remember your saints, both those publicly celebrated and those more humbly remembered. Confident that your work will be completed, we live in faith until the day of your coming. Hear us, O oh God. God of new life, you come among us in the places we least expect. Receive these prayers and those of our hearts in the name of Jesus. Amen. Peace of the Lord be with you always. Share that peace with each other. As you enter worship, you should have received a pre-sealed communion cup. If you don't have one, you can uh, head back out to the narthex and grab that. Um, but if you do, go ahead and start to remove those layers. Uh, all the packaging can go into the bowl at the end of your pew. But go ahead and uh, prepare that stuff now so that you're ready to commune uh, when we get to that point together. And then, as we've been doing, as I mentioned in the sermon, uh, we will be... Uh, uh, engaging in the great thanksgiving and sanctus together. So, John, you can go ahead and give me uh, the first note there, and then um, once you've gotten the uh, layers off of your uh, communion stuff, I invite you to stand as we continue. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right our duty and our joy that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, Almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ. You comforted your people with the promise of the Redeemer through whom you will also make all things new on the day when he comes to judge the world in righteousness. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the host of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy.
the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Come to Christ's banquet. Feast on God's gift of grace. I invite you to pull out that bread now. This is the body of Christ given for you. The body of Christ given for you. And this is the blood of Christ shed for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. Now may the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Most high God, you have come among us at this table. By the Spirit's power, form us to be bearers of your word, sharing gifts of mercy and grace with all, through Jesus Christ, our host and our guest. Amen. Amen. Um. Announcements are pretty, pretty short. Um, all our regular weekly stuff is happening. So uh, Wednesday night worship, Thursday Bible study, uh, all those sorts of things. Um, today is the last day to sign up for Poinsettias. So if you want to do that, you can do that today on the Narthex. And then also the Giving Tree. All of the kids that we had um, tags for, for Giving Tree, were taken. So that's good. You guys did a good job. Now today is the deadline to turn in those gifts, unwrapped. Uh, bring them either here or to the Svensson household. Tim Svensson is council president. So uh, take them one of those places, and then we'll make sure those get to the families in time. So uh, those are the main things. You can join us for a meal on fr- uh, Wednesday at 5 o'clock, but uh, we'd like you to sign up in the Narthex if you're coming so we know how many people to prepare food for. Uh, I think that's all the main announcements, so now I invite you to hear God's blessing. The God of hope, fill us with all joy and peace in believing, so that we may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Spirit, through Christ for whom we wait. Amen.
peace. Christ is near.